Well, good morning. Looking forward to finishing up the sermon series today, unless there's a quick changeover I don't know about. <laughs> no, no. Uh, praying is not. <laughs> no. Yeah, we're looking at Ephesians 6, uh, verses 10 through 18 today, if you want to turn in your Bibles. But it says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and to take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. Pastor. All right, you, you may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Jamie. Uh, thank you, uh, you, Scott and Nancy, and I just, it's been, the service has been a blessing already, amen? amen. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> I knew I was going to get a late start. This is a little later than I thought I might, but worth it. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. And so we're going to finish the series today. I, uh, again, I just so appreciate Pastor Farouk and everybody that scrambled to cover for me last Sunday. And I called my mother this morning and she said, don't tell me you're sick. <laughs> I... Uh, I talked to, uh, to Jacob, who dressed up as me at the harvest party. Some of you were confused, as he had the Pastor Josh name badge on. Uh, he said he's ready to preach if I fall apart. He sent me his PowerPoint, though. It was 80 slides long, so I, uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep that one in our back pockets. But, uh, today, today is the final message on being prepared, um, and uh, we're going to finish. We're going to start out by finishing the notes from two weeks ago um, on... Uh, on prayer. I have a couple of thoughts we didn't get to um, last uh, two Sundays ago that I'm very burdened to cover, and so we're going to do that um, at the start of the message. And then we'll have a very quick review, uh, and just given the amount of time I have, it's going to have to be uh, very quick. But we've had 16 messages uh, out of this prepared series. So this is the 17th and, and final message of it, and uh, I think something special is going to emerge as we step all the way back and look at the bigger picture here this morning. Um, my desire, my, my prayer for you is that this high-level review will do maybe one or, or two things for you. And I know that review, sometimes you think, oh, review, we've heard all this before, and, and that, that may be true if you were here for every part of the series. But here's what I've been praying for for you for today. One, that God might put his finger on something. Something that maybe you were convicted about previously or something that when you heard the message you said, I want God to work on this. I want to work with the Lord on this in my life but maybe you kind of lost track of it. Would you maybe give God permission? Would you maybe ask God even to remind you of the things that he wants you to have gotten out of this series? So as we go through this review, please, I would, I would ask you, don't, don't just tune it out and think, well, I was here for the series, but say to the Lord, God, was there something that you talked to me about in that message and maybe I lost track of it? So God, would you remind me this morning of that thing? Maybe you missed some of these messages, and maybe you missed the one you needed the most. Can I tell you, if you were the devil, which Sunday would you have tried the hardest to keep you out of church? Maybe he did. I mean, maybe it's not your fault. Maybe you got sick, or you were traveling, or whatever the reason was that you missed it, that as we go through the review today, would you, would you ask God, would you say, Lord, would you, would you say to me, that one. And it's one that you would maybe put on your list and you'd note it in your bulletin. You say, I'm going to go, I'm going to get on the website. I'm going to go back and I'm going to get that message. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to the full two hour. Because <laughs> this morning you're only going to get about five minutes, but you, you might say, Hey, I, I want to get the whole thing. All right, our scripture this morning, Ephesians 6, let's read it. Let's read just the first part and then we'll pray and jump. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture. Thank you, God, for the way you've already worked in this service. God, but we believe that you're not done yet. As we open our Bibles and we look at your word, God, we know that you're going to speak because these are, in fact, your words. So, God, we pray for ourselves that you would give us ears to hear, that we would have soft hearts, ready to receive what it is that you would say to us. God, help us not to be distracted by the review nature of much of this, but, Lord, that you might powerfully work in our hearts this morning. God, I need that. We all do. So, God, we know you're going to speak. Help us to hear. And, God, not just hear, but be changed. The kind of change that we can do is superficial at best. But God, we need the kind of deep, life-altering change that only you can do. So God, do that this morning. Do what only you can. Life in the place of death. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your bulletins, we're going to fill some blanks in uh, along this morning. And I'll, and I'll just remind you that one of the themes of this entire series, and I've repeated it in every one of the 16 messages, and I'm going to repeat it again this morning, and it's this, we must have God's strength. The rest of this is all for naught if we do not have God's strength to do it. Finally, my brethren, the Bible says, be strong in the Lord. And if you're not strong in the Lord, if you're only strong in your strength, you are going to fail. We must have God's strength. And the reason that that's true is, is many faceted, but one of the key reasons that that's true is because the primary battle that we are engaged in is a spiritual battle and not a physical one. Many of us are facing physical battles. There's battles with disease and there's battles in relationships and there's battle with, with the world, but the main battle, those are side conflicts. The real battle is a spiritual one. Zechariah 4, 6, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And they were fighting enemies with swords. They were building a wall with bricks. But the word of God to Zerubbabel was, it's not by might and it's not by power. Even though it's swords, even though it's bricks, it's going to be my power or it's not going to be accomplished. And that is still true today. Whatever the physical nature is, it is primarily a spiritual battle. And the reason that that's true is because the real enemy is not other people. Could I remind you again this morning, the real enemy is not other people. And I know people lie about you. I know that people are going to try to tear you down. I know that people will pick fights with you and they will discourage you. I know that the politicians lie. You can tell if their mouths are moving. I know there are people who have made themselves enemies of the cause of Christ. And there are people who have made themselves your enemy, maybe personally. But may I remind you, they are not the true enemy. Maybe henchmen, but not the real enemy. The real enemy is the forces of darkness. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If they have flesh and blood, they're not the one. Do not be distracted into putting your energy into fighting the flesh and blood people. They're not the real enemy. It's the forces of darkness behind them. And because we must have God's strength, and because it is primarily a spiritual war, and because the enemy truly is the forces of darkness, we've got to be connected to power. And I could say to you again this morning, if I may, that prayer is your most important connection to God's power. On a daily basis, if you want power for the battles that you are engaged in, you're going to have to be engaged in prayer. And so the whole sermon two weeks ago was on that. Why don't we pray? If we believe we need God's power, if we believe it's a spiritual war, then why don't we pray? So two weeks ago, we spent the entire message talking about the reasons that we don't pray. But the admonition here in our text, if you skip down to verse 18, Paul here at the end, of he gives us the armor, and we're going to circle back and review that in a moment. But in verse 18, the apostle says, praying always. He says, take up all the armor of God, and then the, the way that you actually, the battle plan. So now that we're armored, how do we actually go about fighting this war? The way you go about fighting the war primarily is a battle of prayer. And he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And he says, and pray for me that utterance, 
Am I really hungry or not? And if you're not, you could critically evaluate why aren't you? And maybe you're deceived about how much you need God. Second key to power in prayer, I believe, is honesty. This one's hard. It is hard to admit need. It is hard to admit weakness. If you start out hungry, it gets easier. If you're hungry, then you can, it's easier to be honest. But even then, I think the danger is especially perilous for those of us that are church people. You, if you grew up in church, or you've been around church for a while, you start to learn to pray church prayers. You know kind of how prayer is supposed to sound. You've heard the way the pastors pray or that we pray for different things. And, and sometimes we get distracted because these are public prayers. It's a little bit of a different thing than when I go into the prayer closet, when it's just me and God, my prayers do not sound like they sound from this pulpit. And I'm not pretending, I'm just telling you, it's a different deal when I'm just talking to God because, I mean, it is now, it didn't used to be. It used to be that I prayed when I was just talking to God the way I prayed when other people were listening and they weren't very honest. Can I give you a thought this morning? God already knows everything that you're thinking and feeling. He already knows. You have never bowed your head to talk to God and had him go, Really? Never. There's no reason to pretend when you're praying. If you pretend to think or feel something untrue, it will only rob you of the ability to communicate with the only one that can help. Yeah, that's true. And I did that for years with my daughter Evangeline, where I would bow my head to pray and I would say, God, thank you for Evangeline and thank you for taking such good care of us. And we just appreciate all the ways that you look after us and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I meant almost none of that because I did not feel like God was taking very good care of us. And I did not appreciate what God was doing because I felt he should be doing much more than he was. But I wasn't talking to him about that. And it was a breakthrough day in my life when I bowed my head and told God how furious I was with him and what a bad job I thought he was doing as God. Now, you don't want to hear your pastor pray that way from the pulpit. <laughs> But you know who was not surprised to hear that? God. He knew that's how I felt about it. The only thing that changed when I started being honest with God was that God and I were talking again. That was the only thing that changed. And it was good. What's going on with you? I know at church we say, oh, I'm good. And that's fine here. When you talk to God, why don't you tell him what's really going on? Humility is the third key to power in prayer. I believe it's humility. Do you really think God knows better than you or not? I don't. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to. I mean, don't misunderstand me this morning. I, I'm trying to believe that God knows better than me, but I spend a lot of time thinking God like, should really do something different than what he's clearly doing. I call it my magic wand test. Now, just... Don't, don't freak out here. I don't believe in magic. I'm just telling you that, like, if, if I, imagine if I had a wand that I could just change a situation, would I change it? Right? Yes. You gave me one of those things that would run all over this church and zap, 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 zap. <laughs> right? Many of you, high on my list, run right over and bang, fix it. Here's the question, though. Could God fix all these things? Yes. Obviously, he could. But is he doing it? In many cases, No. What's that mean? If we would fix it where God is not fixing it, we are in fact saying that God's not doing it right. That we're going to undo what God has clearly decided to allow. Yikes. And I think about this. And I would still, there are still things that would change. But here's what I've gotten to. And I would like to get to the point in my life, and you pray for your pastor that I could get here. I would like to get to the point in my life where I could say, God, I, I actually trust you. I believe that what you're doing is best. But I'm not there yet in, in all areas. In some areas, I'm there. But in some of the very hard areas of my life, I, I'm, I'm genuinely not there. I'll tell you where I have gotten. I've gotten that I believe that in heaven, I will look back and agree with God that he was right. I think, I really, I really do believe that. I believe that in heaven, when I step across that river, that I'm going to say, you know what, Lord? All the things, all those no's for Evangeline, I believe that was the right call. Yeah. You, did, you did the right thing, God. 
No, he's not waiting on pins and needles for my approval. I don't think God's nervous about that. But for me, just to know that someday, even though today I struggle to agree with God, I believe that someday I'll agree with him. That's as close to humility on the subject as I've been able to get. But it's going the right direction for me. That was a step in the right direction for me. And it might be for you too. Do you really think that God knows better than you? If God's answer turns out to be different from what you want, are you prepared to accept that God knows better? It'll help your prayer life. It's really helped mine. Even that halting, half-hearted, barely counts humility has really helped my prayer life. And I strongly recommend it. And then fourthly, the fourth key that I found to power in prayer is a focus on eternity. Am I more concerned with being comfortable or am I more concerned with the eternal value? I think most of my conflict, maybe all of my conflict with God over whether or not he's doing right or not, has to do with God is concerned about eternal souls and I'm concerned about things not hurting quite so bad. And it seems like you shouldn't have to choose. <laughs> That's the part that I get stuck on. But as, I, as, as God is helping me shift my perspective to a more eternal focus, I found it's much easier to pray. And I see God do more and more dramatic things. Instead of just praying for Evangeline to be well, I've been praying more that God would use Evangeline to change people's lives. Amen. And it's exciting to watch God do that. It's exciting to watch God do that and to be a part of it. Somebody said, do you spend more time praying to keep saints out of heaven or to see sinners go there? That sounds weird at first, but like I, that convicted me. I looked at my prayer list and I realized I had lots of prayers for sick Christians to get healthy. But you all know that even sick Christians are eventually going to, even if they get healthy, they're going to die eventually anyway. How much are you praying for sick Christians to get healthy versus lost sinners to get saved? It was a conviction in my heart about where my priorities were. Pray for sick Christians to get well. No, no, you're gonna, I'm going to need a bigger amen than that. Christian, we got a lot of sick people. We got a lot of people with a really severe need. They need our prayer. Somebody say amen. amen. We, we need to pray for each other. We need to pray for these broken relationships. God sometimes does dramatically heal. I have had a front row seat to spectacular, unexplainable, medically impossible miracles in people's lives. And I believe it's because Christians asked God and he said yes. I'm just telling you, let's not lose sight of what is eternally important over just the things that make life better or more exciting. Paul in prison says, pray for me in verse 19, that utterance might be given to me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He doesn't say, pray for me that an angel will deliver me like he delivered Peter. He says, pray that I'll be brave. Paul do firsthand that some of the best soul winning opportunities are in jail. The Philippian jailer and his whole family. And then the revival that started in that city. It started because he was in prison. So Paul says, I don't really care if I'm in prison or not. I just want the gospel to go forward. If the people that need to get saved are here in prison, fine. Just put me where the prisoner, just put me where the people that need Jesus are. I love the testimony of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It's there in Daniel 3, 17. And I love the testimony of these young men. The king builds this golden idol. He says, when we play the music, you all better bow down to this idol. We're going to throw you in a fiery furnace. And, the, and the, they, they, they don't bow down. They say, we won't do it. We're not going to dishonor God. And so he bring them in front of the king. The king says, listen, I like you guys. So I'm going to give you another chance. But you better bow down when that music plays or into the fiery furnace. And the response of these young men to the king is so incredible. He says, our God, which we serve, is able to deliver us out of your hand, O king. And then here comes a really good part. They say, but even if not, we're not going to bow down to your statue. I mean, isn't that good? <laughs> They're just like, our God can deliver us from anything. And he might not do it. But we're sticking with him anyway. We're sticking with him anyway. They had prioritized loyalty to God over burning to death. And that was a good choice. Boy, that was a good choice. And God didn't save him from going into the fire, but he saved him out of it. So are you connected to power? If you're not Christian, do not do, do not just take up the armor and then not have a plan. 
do not have the power then to use this. And we need to be people of prayer. If there's a, listen, two weeks ago, why don't we pray? Consider maybe for yourself, why don't you pray? Why don't you pray as much as you ought to? And you say, my prayers feel real powerless. Can I recommend these four things to you this morning? Consider, are you hungry? Are you honest? Are you humble? And are you looking at eternity? If you start to do those things, build those muscles up, it'll help you as you pray. Okay. Now let's spend the next 15 minutes. You know that's a lie. <laughs> it's true. That's what I'm aiming at. We will fail. <laughs> we like how you all got blamed for this here. Fo oh, that's good, sister. That's right. Focus on eternity. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about the armor. The Bible also says we need God's armor. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and put on the whole armor of God. We must not just have our armor. We need God's armor. I'd like to remind you some of the things we've talked about these last 16 messages. The armor that God has provided. It's here for us in Ephesians 6, 13 to 17. Um, the first up is the belt of truth. We spent um, five messages. That was almost a quarter of this series uh, was on just dealing with truth. And it's that, it's, I believe it really is um, that important. Not a quarter. Math. Okay. <laughs> Prepared to stand against lies. We need the belt of truth to stand against lies. And, and we spent so much time on this one because lies are the devil's favorite tactic. He is the father of lies. It's one of the core elements of our enemy is lies. And there's many lies that we face. There's lies that other people are going to tell about you. Are you ready? Are you prepared for when people tell lies about you? It's going to happen. What about the lies you tell yourself? I find those to be more dangerous than the lies people tell about me. I don't like it when people lie about me. But the lies I tell myself sound more believable. Because they're usually mostly true. But you know a glass that's mostly water and only a little bit poison is still real bad for you. Are you ready for the lies you're going to tell yourself? Are you ready for the lies about the, even the existence of truth? The devil's gone so far in, in our day and age that the idea that truth as an objective idea even exists is being lied about. There is no such thing as truth. What is truth? We looked at the top seven lies that the world wants you to believe. These are very persuasive lies. The world is very invested in trying to get you to believe these lies. Lie number one, if you want to be happy, follow your heart. Boy, that's bad advice. That is garbage. Gar I know it's every Disney movie, but boy, is it bad advice. Number two, if I really feel it, it must be true. No. Your feelings will lie, 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 lie to you. They are unstable and fickle and change. And if you're relying on feelings for truth, you are in for a world of hurt. But the world wants you to believe that. Number three, the world says it's unloving to call anything sin. That's like saying it's unloving for a doctor to call anything a disease. Is the doctor unloving when he says cancer's bad? Maybe we should cut it out? No. We need to know the things that are actually bad. And turns out, sin, real bad for you. But the world says, if you call it sin, you're not loving. Number four, a good God wouldn't judge. That's like saying a good police officer would never arrest anybody. Well, if he's a good cop, he would never put anybody in jail. Well, wait a minute. There are bad people that need to go to jail. At least. But the world wants you to believe a good God wouldn't judge, but that's wrong. It's not true. Number five, the world wants you to believe that life is a product of chance and evolution. You are a chemistry experiment. You are a spill of chemicals that has accidentally gained consciousness. Why are you so depressed? I don't understand. Why is everybody so hopeless all the time? Just because life is pointless and nothing matters? It's not true anyway. It's a lie. Number six, the world wants you to believe the Bible is similar to other religious books. 
So, oh, you know, all roads lead to heaven and, you know, these, uh, these religious ideas and those religious ideas. And they're all basically saying the same thing. Just the characters are changed and small differences. But every religion basically the same. It's not true. The Bible is radically and fundamentally different from any other religious book. That doesn't in itself make it true or right, but do not group it in with all the other books. It is not the same. It must be evaluated on its own merit. Number seven, the world wants you to believe that faith is the opposite of knowledge and the opposite of reason. So, well, well we're people of science. We're people of reason. So we're not into all that faith stuff. Well, first of all, nonsense some of the most superstitious people you'll ever meet. But second of all, biblical faith is a result of knowing some things and reasoning through them. Biblical faith is not the opposite of knowledge and reason. In fact, in many ways, it's built on that. And we preached a whole sermon on all of those. So there's so many lies out there. Lies that other people are going to tell about you. Lies you're going to tell yourself. Lies about the existence of truth. Very popular lies the world is going to try to foist onto you. What on earth can you possibly do against such a tsunami, a tidal wave of lies? Put on the belt of truth. Be prepared. How do we do that? I, I had a couple of things that we were a theme through those messages. The first one was hang on to the vital importance of objective truth. Do not let the world convince you that there's no such thing as objective truth. Some things are true and some things are false. That's it. Jesus either rose from the dead or he didn't. There's no like, blah, 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 blah. no, he did or didn't. He did or didn't. And what I believe, if I believe it's true, doesn't make it true. If I believe it's false, doesn't make it false. It either happened or it didn't. Hang on to objective truth. We must. Secondly, truth is an anchor against the storms of emotions. Emotions aren't bad. God gave you emotions. It's okay to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those that weep. And some things ought to make us angry, the Bible says. This is don't let the sun go down on your wrath. But some things ought to fire you up. Somebody say Amen. But I'm telling you, you need truth to anchor those emotions or they will blow you out to sea. And you will destroy relationships. And then I'd like to encourage you to regularly ask yourself the three truth questions. The first one's this. What does God see? You're trying to figure out against lies, whether lies people are telling about you or lies you're telling yourself or lies the world is trying to sell. Question one, what does God see when he looks at this? What's God see? That'll help anchor you to the truth. Number two, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about this? That'll anchor you to the truth if you know what the Bible says about it. Thirdly, what's the eternal perspective? What's going to matter here in the long run? If, you, if you'll get good at asking yourself those three questions, you will be strapping on the belt of truth and ready against the storms of lies. All right, now that was five messages. We're going to go the other ones a little bit quicker. <laughs> Second thing we looked at was the breastplate of righteousness. What do we need the breastplate of righteousness for? We need it to be prepared to stand against selfishness. Selfishness is baked into the human condition. We are naturally selfish people. I wish it weren't true. But it comes down fundamentally to it's Adam versus Christ. And two decisions that were made in two different gardens. And that decision is, is it my will or is it thy will? Adam in the garden, not deceived. He knew what he was about and he chose his way over God's way. He said, I'm going to do it my way. And here we are. Jesus Christ in another garden, thousands of years later, bowed his head and said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And here we are today. But the question faces you and I every single day. Every day when you wake up, you're going to have to make a decision about that day. And then probably again by lunch. And then probably again by dinner. How, whose way are we going today? How are we going to handle it? My way or his way? How do we put on a breastplate of righteousness? We are not righteous people. We're just not. We're, we are selfish people. How on earth do we go against that selfishness and put on a breastplate of righteousness? I, the, the suggestion from the scriptures, I believe, is to practice putting on Christ. 
It was practice putting him on as, as if he were clothing, as, as if he were armor. You, you put on Christ. And that's, a, that's an odd thought to think about. And it can feel a little bit like pretending. And you heard me just a couple of minutes ago, bang this pulpit and tell you never to pretend when you're praying. Somebody say amen that you heard that. But what I'd like to tell you is there are two kinds of pretending. And though fi the kind that we might call bad pretending is where we're pretending the pretense is there instead of the real thing. Where it's not true and we're just pretending. We're trying to fake people out. Whether we're trying to fake God out or, or fake other people out, we want them to think something about us that's not true. It's, it's bad pretending. The pretense is there instead of the real thing. But good pretending, if you will, good pretending is when we are pretending with the aim to become the thing we are pretending. I gave you a couple examples in that sermon. I, I said, sometimes you, many of us have had this experience where you got drug along to a party you didn't really want to go to. You didn't really feel like, hey, I don't want to be there. And I'm, not feeling in the, I'm not feeling social. I'm not feeling friendly. But you don't want to be rude. So you like smile and try to make conversation. You pretend a little. But then what happens mostly when we do that? After a while, you start to actually like, oh, I'm actually having an okay time. And maybe I am actually feeling a little more friendly or a little more social than I thought, right? It's good pretending where we would like to be better than we are. And so we're striving to become that thing. And as we go about doing that, a wonderful thing can happen where we can become more like what we are aiming to be. This is what we do with children. We, we talk to them as if they're older than they are. We talk to them as if they understand more than they are. We start to give them little bits of responsibility. We're not confused that they're adults. We're trying to grow them up to become adults, right? He's, Hugo is pretending to drive the boat. I, I am very nervous to have a teenager driving a car. So we pretend right? So that he can start to build those skills, build those muscles so that someday he will hopefully become the good driver he believes he is. <laughs> Even though we are not like Christ yet, we ought to be aiming to be. Amen. So try to act like Christ would act. Try to behave like Christ would behave. Put him on with the aim of becoming like him. Thirdly, we talked about the shoes of the gospel of peace, and we need the shoes to be prepared for trouble in our relationships. Do you have relationships? You're going to have trouble in them. You know how I know that? Because you're a sinner. And the other people in your relationships are sinners. And so there's going to be trouble. Are you ready for that trouble? We had... Uh, Two messages on this. The first one, when we talked about what about when there's no peace with God. Now, obviously, God doesn't do anything wrong. If there's a problem in your relationship with God, I'll give you three guesses who's probably at fault. But we sometimes we have problems in our relationship with God. We, we are missing peace with God. We also have problems with others. That one's easier. All kinds of trouble in our relationships with others. It doesn't matter how close or distant we are, if they're immediate family or if they're our own children or if they're people at church. And, and you would, I had somebody say to me once, uh, I feel like church is a place where there shouldn't be any drama. <laughs> and I was like, I, I hate to tell you this, but we let people come here. <laughs> Sinners, no less. Yeah, that's a rough deal. Well, you're going to have trouble with others, even at church, even in your own family. You're going to have trouble sharing the gospel. Listen, we all, Christian, I know that, I know that you're, you have a burden like I do, that you want to, you have lost people, people that you love that don't know Jesus. You know they need him. You want him to know him. But we have trouble in that, we're, we're, that relationship dynamics, it, it throws us off in sharing the gospel. We need the shoes of the gospel of peace. How do we get skilled with them? How do we get skilled? Two things I'd like to suggest on this Number one, you got to believe and embrace the gospel. Not just believe it, but embrace the gospel. Have you embraced the gospel? Is the gospel something that you have intellectual knowledge about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Or is that something that you have thrown your arms all the way around and said, this is the gospel and it is a part of me and I'm a part of it. Listen, the whole idea of baptism is not to get a bath with an audience. The baptism is, it's immersion. It's a picture of the immersion into Christ. That we're not separated from him. That we are a part and parcel with Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, is our death, burial, and resurrection. 
Have you embraced the gospel? We embrace it both internally and externally. When we embrace the gospel internally, we find peace within. When you are okay with God, it doesn't matter what's happening around you. Or it matters way less. There's an incredible stability that comes from knowing that you're okay with God. Even if they're lying about you, even if they're trying to destroy you, even if everything is falling apart, if you and Jesus are okay, there's wonderful peace. But that wonderful peace comes from embracing the gospel for ourselves internally. But then we also embrace it externally. We embrace the gospel and its, our, its effect on our relationships with others. When you really embrace the gospel, when you realize that Jesus died not just for you, which he for sure did, but that he died for lost, broken, offensive, obnoxious, recalcitrant, unrepentant sinners. Yeah. In other words, that person that you were all thinking about? Yeah, that one. Yeah. When you embrace the gospel that Jesus loved and shed his blood for that person, when we embrace that dynamic, the motivation for peace externally becomes very powerful. And that peace externally comes through reconciliation or it comes from separation. But either way, embracing the gospel for that person will make for peace. Preached the whole message on that. The second part of embracing the gospel, the shoes of the gospel, is making a straight path, making it easy to make peace. What have you prepared to make a straight path for in your life. A straight path, the, the idea there is smooth, level, no obstacles, a straight shot. It's not, it's not a winding uphill road with switchbacks and rocks in it. It's the straight, obvious path that mostly we're going to go on, right? So they, it's like a freeway, right? If you're going to go any distance at all, you'll take the straightest shot you can. What are the, what are the straight paths in your life? Have you organized your life and habits to make it easy to forgive people? I mean, do you, do you have the patterns that are like easy to forgive people? Is it easy to reconcile? Is it easy to think the best of others? Try to make those the well-worn paths, the well-trod paths. Put things on your schedule that make it easy to make peace. Put things on your schedule that make it easy to share the gospel. I want to be better at sharing the gospel with people, but I found that if I haven't made a path for it, then I don't do it very much. And so I have things on my schedule where I'm like, I'm going to intentionally be engaged in getting the gospel out there so that there are opportunities so that I can do something. I've made a, I've made a path for it. Y'all with me this morning? I was, one of the reasons of coming to church is so important. It's like, I'll tell you, I've seen it over and over and over. They get mad, you get mad at somebody else at church. So what's step one? You quit coming to church. Why? So we don't see them. Because that'll for sure make it better. No. And then other relationships start to fall apart. Right? And the snowball goes the wrong direction. Versus you come to church and be like, you know what? They're super obnoxious, but I like that thing about them. I mean, that's one of the awful things about COVID and all the lockdowns and all the separations. And I watched it not just in churches, but in families where people, when you stop spending any time together, then all the misunderstandings and all the hurt feelings, and there's no straight path. There's no obvious, easy way to fix those things or remember the good things. And so it piles up and piles up until yeah. that's the sound it makes. Except there's more screaming. What are the straight paths in your life? Fourthly, we talked about the shield of faith. The shield of faith. We need the shield of faith so that we can be prepared for trouble with fear and trouble with doubt. Fear is coming. Doubt is coming. Maybe it's already here. I, I remember as a young man, as a young Christian, I used to think that, that we needed the shield of faith for those irrational fears, for those unreasonable doubts. But I don't believe that's what's in view here. The problem is, is that many of our fears, many of our doubts are perfectly reasonable. Many of them are perfectly rational. I've come to believe that there are some things, if it doesn't make you afraid, you're probably a sociopath. <laughs> like how on earth, facing the staggering scale of some of the things that many of you in this room this morning are facing, how could you not be afraid? With some of the heartbreak and the loss and the grief and the heaviness and the hurt and the betrayal, how could we not have some doubts? 
Of course you do. Of course we do. So how do you deal with the reasonable fears, with the rational doubts? We have doubts about God's trustworthiness. We wonder if we can really trust him. We have doubts about God's power. Can he really do anything about it? We have doubts about God's care. Does he really care about this situation? Does he really care about me? The shield of faith, we need to be prepared for these things. And we are prepared with the shield of faith. You must be skilled with it. How do we become skilled with the shield of faith? Well, you raise it above all. The Bible, the Bible says above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, above all does not mean it's the most important thing. Above all means out in front and covering. The idea of the shield of faith is that it's not, it's not just another piece of armor. It's the one that you put out in front of everything else, above the helmet, in front of the breastplate, in front of the boots and the belt. The shield of faith is out in front so that it can extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. The word shield here is the scutum. It's for the Roman scutum shield. Uh, the Greek historian Polybus said that this large shield gave the Roman soldiers both protection and confidence, which they owed to the size of the shield. Not only was it effective at blocking those arrows, but the fact that they had this big shield made them braver. That's the idea of the shield of faith. When we, when we have a reasoned confidence in the trustworthiness and power of God, it will not only protect you, it'll give you more confidence also. I'd like to remind you this about faith. When we think about taking up the shield of faith, the reason we don't is because we get this idea. They sell posters at Hobby Lobby that basically say this. Faith is basically wishful thinking. <laughs> but it's not. Faith is not wishful thinking. If you've gotten the idea that faith is wishful thinking or just being hopeful or being positive, that's not what faith is. Faith, biblical faith, is a reasoned confidence in the trustworthiness and in the power of God. Biblical faith is not, I hope things work out. Or despite all the evidence, I'm going to just trust God. Now you could do that, but that's not what biblical faith is. Biblical faith says, I know enough about God and what he's like. I have enough experience with Jesus to know what he's like. And I have judged that it is reasonable for me to trust him for the things I don't understand. Have you decided that it's reasonable to trust God? If it is, raise that shield above and out in front. Number five, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is preparing us for approaching death. Death is coming. I've had some of that heaviness even just here this morning. Death is coming for our bodies. And death is coming for all of our works. People think they're going to escape death by leaving some kind of a legacy behind, and that's a fine thought, but time eventually erases all that also. But it's worse than that. Beyond the death of our bodies and the death of our works, there is the disaster of the second death. The disaster of not just dying once, but dying twice. Of facing two deaths. What can we do against this onslaught of death? We must become skilled with the helmet of salvation. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. I love to sing it. I love to see signs that say it. I like to see it lit up in neon and on posters and on cards. I love, love, love to hear and see and read that Jesus saves. It's true. But could I say this to you this morning? Jesus saves from what? I like to ask people that. They'll say, Jesus saves. They'll say, praise God. Save from what? And if you can't answer that question, it's not great. It's not great. We should know. If a fireman saved you, you'd know what you got saved from. If a lifeguard saved you, you'd know what you got saved from. What did Jesus save you from? I'll tell you. He saved you from death and he saved you from hell. Jesus saves from death and hell. And we need to know that. And others need to know that. They need, not only need to know that Jesus saves, they need to know what he saves from. And by the way, only Jesus saves. Amen. There's not other options to get saved. If you want to get saved from death, there's only one person that's ever beat death, and his name is Jesus Christ. If you want to get saved from hell, there's only one person who's taken away the keys of death and hell and has them in his hand and sits at the right hand of the Father, and his name is Jesus. 
If you want to be saved from death and hell, you need Jesus. There's much we could say and much we could preach about Jesus, and God knows that we do. But I'll tell you this morning, there are four essential points, non-negotiable. You must know these four things if you want Jesus to save you from death and hell. You must know them. If you're here this morning and you're like, I don't know them, then I would like to say this to you. You're invited to stay for lunch. I'm not trying to be coy. I preached the whole message on it. You can get online too, but I'm already way past time. So let me tell you this. Stay for lunch. We'll take a Bible. We're not going to show you the Baptist way or my opinion. We'll show you right from the Bible. The things that you must know about Jesus Christ to be saved from death and hell. And then lastly, we talked about the sword of the Spirit. We talked about the sword of the Spirit. The Bible says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is, verse 17, which is the Word of God. It is not a mystery what this piece of armor is. It is the Word of God. And I'd like to tell you, we must be prepared for disarmed Christianity. As long as there have been swords, the surrendering of your sword has been a symbol of surrender. It's not you give up your helmet to show you surrendered. It's not you give up your boots to show you surrendered. When you hand over your sword, they know you've given up. There's no fight left. The enemy wants to disarm you. He wants you to give up your Bible. Because the Bible is the word of God. It is our sword. The enemy would like to disarm you by doubting God's word. He doesn't really care why you put down the sword. Just as long as you do. And if the devil can say, are you really sure that the Bible's really the word of God? And isn't it men's opinions? And didn't they play the telephone game with it for thousands of years? And aren't there other gospels and messages that got deleted out of the Bible? And blah, 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 blah. Are you really, yay, hath God said? Yeah. That's all it is. And if, God can, and if the devil can get you to put down your sword, he's won. Mm -hmm. You've unilaterally disarmed and surrendered as a Christian. The devil will get you to put down your sword through ignorance of God's word. You say, well, I believe every word of God. I, I've never read it. I don't know what's in there. That works for the devil too. Sometimes he'll get us to put down our sword through cultural compromise. Oh, that's very old fashioned. People don't think like that anymore. They don't talk like that anymore. That's not how we do things nowadays. We got science. And so we compromise the word of God and put our swords down. He silences Christians through intimidation. If you say that, bad things are going to happen to you. You might get kicked off Twitter. Oh, no. I don't know. Maybe not now. I don't know now. I don't... But who cares? Don't let the devil intimidate you into silence and put down your sword. Sometimes he does it through overconfident pride. Pride will get you too. You'll put down your sword because I have done this. I thought I can win these people without using my Bible. I don't need the scriptures. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to reason with them. I'm going to argue with them. We're going to have an intellectual clash of titans. I'm going to smoke these fools. <laughs> and between you and me, I feel like, you know, maybe I did. But if they don't get saved, if there's no Bible in there, who cares? We put down our sword. The devil doesn't care if you win an argument. He cares where people are going to go for eternity. And if you put down your sword, then there's nothing we can do for eternity. Don't put down your sword. Amen. How do we become skilled with it? And this is the end of the message here. We become skilled with the sword of the Spirit by remembering that the Bible is our only offensive weapon. It's the only offensive weapon. Now, all, most of the armor is to make sure you don't go down, that you stand there for. But if you want to make an impact for the kingdom, if you want to have some impact on the world, if you want to make a difference in your family, if you want to make a difference in your neighborhood or with your grandkids or with your friends, you need your Bible for that. You're, there's nothing we can do outside of that. I mean, pray for them and be a good testimony and be a good example and try not to be so selfish. I mean, do all those things. But at some point, the sword's got to get swung. Yeah. And then be confident in it. Be confident in it. The Bible. Oh, Christian, the Bible's so worthy of our confidence. And I know there's people who are like, well, there's no evidence. Of blah, 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 blah. You know, and they say that until they find the evidence. Over and over, the Bible just keeps getting proved of how incredibly accurate it is. But you know what? I'm not waiting for them to dig something new up out of the dirt before I believe the Bible's true. It's obviously true. So just have some confidence in it. If you've got confidence in it, then study it. Know what's in there. I got good news for you. You come to a church that prioritizes this. 
Every Sunday morning is basically a Bible study, and the pastor doesn't care how late after one it is. You're welcome. Come study. Yeah, that's it. I come study the Word of God with us. Come on Wednesday night. Come to adult Bible study. Come, I mean, study it yourself too, but, but come study with us. The Bible's a wonderful, wonderful book. And I love to preach it, and you probably guessed that by now, but I'm telling you, study it and then put it into practice. Put it into practice. It's fine to have a gun, but you should probably know how to use it. You gotta, at some point, you got to go down to the firing range and light off a couple of rounds and learn how it works. Don't just know stuff about the Bible. Do what the Bible says. Amen. Way more powerful to put it into practice than just know stuff about it. What are you doing with what the Bible says? If you know what it says, happy are ye, now go do. All right, so trouble is coming. Trouble's coming. When God gave me this burden um, in the beginning or last spring, I think it was, to, to preach this message, the, the burden that was specifically on my heart was that trouble is coming. Trouble's on the way. Many of you, as we talk about these things, you're already in the midst of these problems. I know that you are. And if you're not, it's, it's on its way. Are you prepared to stand when the trouble comes? The devil wants to knock you over. He wants to choke you out. He wants to rub your face into the mud and then start to jump on your back. Prepare to stand. Sister, if you'd come and, and even just play, I'll just say that trouble's coming with lies. Lies that others are going to tell about you. Lies you're going to tell yourself. Very popular lies the world's going to sell you. There's trouble coming with selfishness. There's trouble coming in your relationships. Trouble with doubts. Trouble with fear. Trouble with approaching death. Trouble because the devil's trying to disarm you. Trouble is certainly on the way. It's the last time I'm going to ask you this for a long time. It's the 17th message. This will be the 17th time I've asked you, but could I, could I say, even though you've heard it a lot, would you take this question seriously? Are you ready? Are you ready? Don't, don't think that because on, the, on, the, on one of these issues, you're maybe not in the middle of the trouble right now. Don't think that means you're exempt from it, please. It would really be better, it would really help you if you were prepared for it. Take unto you the whole armor of God. If you're here this morning, you're not sure that you're saved. You, you're not sure where you stand with God. You say, I, I hope I go to heaven. I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in favor of Jesus. But if you're not sure where you stand with him, you're not 100% you're not positive of where you're at with God, today could be your day. You could know for sure. Please don't delay. We have no idea how long we got left. Stay for lunch. And let's take a Bible and help you know for sure. If you're saved, can I ask you again, if you, you know you need God's power, I, I don't need to ask you that. I, I know that you know you need God's power. But can I ask you a question? Just read honest. Answer honestly in your own heart. No one's going to raise a hand. I'm not going to ask anyone to come forward to do anything like that. I, I, just, I just really want you to answer this honestly in your own heart. Between you and God, are you spending the time in prayer with God that you should be? Or do you have things handled pretty well without needing God's help? If that's you, you could talk to God about it today. You could talk about some of those keys for power in prayer. It starts with hunger and honesty, humility. You can talk to him about it. Did God want to remind you about something from this series? We're done in a minute. Baked potatoes are coming. I know it's late. But did God want to remind you something about this series? I, I, I hope this review was not a waste of time. My, my, my burden is that, and I, and I prayed a lot for, for, for you, that as we did this, that, There'd be a, a, one item, maybe two, that God would say to, to your heart. I want to talk to you more about that. Do you know which one it was? You could talk to him about it right now. If there's a message that God's calling you to go back and listen to, which one is it? I know in my life, if I don't schedule things, I don't do it. it here in the quietness, if God said, hey, that's that message, you missed that one and you need it or you need to hear that one again or something, I would say make a note, make a plan here when I stop talking, just a moment, make a plan for, you know what, this Thursday, 
you know, this afternoon, whatever, whatever it's going to be, I'm going to go back and I'm going to listen or I'm going to figure it out, make a plan. Maybe it's something else, I don't know. I don't know what it is that God wanted to talk to you about today, but I, but I know that he wants to talk to you. He loves you. Listen, I, this is your pastor. I am rooting for you. I don't want you to go down. I don't want to watch any of you get choked out by the devil. I've seen too many Christians just get made shipwreck by any of the things on this list. I've watched it happen. And I, don't, I just don't want it for you. I hope this series has been helpful. And don't miss this chance to get the armor of God on. Stay connected to his power. Get the armor on. Stand, therefore.